Happy New Year, Facebook friends. Welcome to 2023. I'm Angie Garza, Director of Professional Learning and Educational Services at RWE 47, serving Lee, Ogle, and Whiteside counties. And we are so happy to have you join us back here this fine January morning in our bright and shining new year, 2023. Um, today, as we resume our teacher talks for the 2022-23 school year. We are focusing on people who inspire us um, and really some inspirational stories from across our three counties to help propel us into this exciting new year and new world of education. And as we ring in the new year together, uh, I am always very happy to welcome my friend, colleague, and forever co-host, Ms. Stacy Dingus. Stacy, happy new year. Welcome back to Teacher Talk. So good to see you back here on Teacher Talk again. Happy new year, Angie, 2023. Uh, how did we get here, right? Um, I'm excited about a new year of Teacher Talks. Today we have um, new year, new face, a new friend on, on uh, that we're featuring on our Teacher Talk. Um, not a new face to some of our educators in the Lee Ogle and Whiteside area um, because she did just grant us with her presence and her wise words um, only a, a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, I was out of town and so I am excited about this one because I heard great things and um, I, I get to now um, kind of take it in what everyone else uh, got to. So I will let you do the introductions, Angie, but I'm excited to get our first teacher talk of 2023 started. You know what, Stacey, you did miss out. I don't want to make you um, feel bad, but it was just an incredible day of learning with our guest this morning, Lainey Lawson. Um, I told other colleagues, um, you know, in the in the weeks since she was at Sock Valley Community College that um, I don't know that I've laughed more and learned more in a day of training. Um, so, you know, and, and it's a tough conversation um, as we get started here with Lainey, we're talking about classroom management, student behaviors, understanding ourselves um, as adults in relation to what we're experiencing in the classroom and in the community with our children and how to best address that. And so um, approaching it in, in, a, in a fun and informative and non-threatening way was a, a great way to spend the day with Lainey. So um, Without any further ado, I want to welcome to our teacher talk here this morning in 2023, Lainey Lawson. She is the facilitator and guru of Teach, Train, Thrive and was here with us in December of 2022. She is a board certified behavior analyst, and we're going to talk to her about what those credentials mean. But uh, good morning, Lainey. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Good morning. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I really appreciate y'all having me. You know what? I love your energy. And so you are always a wonderful storyteller. So the story I'm most interested as we start off our time together here this morning on Teacher Talk is who's Lainey? Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey as far as uh, you know, not only working with students, but also working with educators on, on this really important topic of student behaviors and really understanding trauma and, and adult behaviors as well. Yeah, of course. So um, the first thing y'all are gonna notice is I don't sound like you. <laughs> um, the first thing people always say is, whoa, where are you from? So I'm from Georgia. I'm from a small town in the middle of nowhere, Georgia. Um, and I had a journey to being an educator. Honestly, I was always pulled, always felt called to work with students who struggle. Um, I started off as an EBD self-contained teacher in Georgia. Georgia's a little bit different. So I had K through five in one classroom and boy, was it fun to go A, F, L, A, B, 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 to my kindergartner while I'm also like multiplying and dividing fractions. Um, so personally, my story starts a long time before that. I grew up with a high trauma home life and was actually a little girl who didn't really know how the world worked and kind of got gave up on by some of my teachers. So that drove me to work with students with problem behavior and drove me to work with the students who have trauma and who go through things. Um, so I was just so invested in being a teacher. I was going to be a teacher for 30 years and they were going to have to like force me to retire. I already was planning to be defiant 
from retiring from teaching. Um, the problem was at one point I had a black eye and a handprint bruise on my arm from a student and didn't have any advice as to how to reach my students further. The crazy thing is I wasn't going to my um, administrator saying things like, you need to fix this. I was going to them saying, I just want resources. I still love my kids. Even with a black eye, I want to work here. Um, But the problem is I don't have what I need in the form of training and I need more training. And it turns out there was no training um, for people like me or anyone who just wants to understand behavior better as an educator. Um, so I got so mad about it. I got a whole master's degree, um, and I became a board certified behavior analyst, which we can talk about more what that is, but basically I dedicated my entire life to understanding behavior and to then bring back that information to educators. Cause the problem is, is the people who study behavior for their job don't really share that information with school districts. So I, I love hearing about your story because I think we're all called to do, you know, what we're doing in our lives. And I, I love the fact that you made that decision to share that wisdom with others um, in, in just a really comfortable and even sometimes uh, from our training with you, a uh, humorous way, a uh, lighthearted way. And so um, I, you know, you brought up that BCBA, it sounds very intimidating, board certified behavior, behavior analyst. Um, what, what, did, what the heck does that mean? And, and what kind of training did you have to have? And, and how does that impact um, your expertise and your work um, with our, our educators and our students? That's a really good question. Um, So a BCBA, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, is somebody who has stepped into the world of behavior and studied it specifically for years. I got very lucky that I lived within driving distance in Atlanta. Now I had to fight Atlanta traffic to get there. So that was fun. Um, But I got to work in a place that housed a severe behavior unit and other research areas. where they were just researching behavior. And there's only three places like this in the whole country. And I happened to be able to go work at one. And in that place, I got to wear a helmet, chest plate, arm guards, and leg guards to work with any student there. Um, So there was very intense behavior happening. The students, obviously I loved it. Like that's my perfect setting. I love it more than anything. But the cool thing is most BCBAs, most people with the fancy letters after their name, did it by working in home therapy or like other types of things, specifically working with students with disabilities. Um, I never did that type of therapy. I actually got to work under six or seven BCBAs every single day that I had constant access to. And I got to be the one who was implementing procedures that would later be published in research. So these these fancy BCBAs that I was working for, super intelligent, like some of the best behavior minds in the country, they're conducting research, but somebody has to be the one who's actually working with the student to implement those protocols to see if that research worked. That got to be me. So I got to work with a team of people who is implementing things to see later, is this a something that's later going to turn into a research-based method, right? Because is what we're doing going to turn into behavior change for this student? Um, so that was my path, which is unique. It's not normal that that's your path, but I got very lucky. Um, I got immersed in the world of behavior. You have to be supervised once a week to become a BCBA, which means somebody sits down and challenges you for an hour. It's not supervised in the way of like, almost like they're the boss telling you what to do. It's more like, hmm, what do you think is the highest preferred item for that student? You know, and they'll, and then you'll say, well, he likes the iPad and they'll say, you don't know what he likes, prove it, go run an assessment, go show me the data, go graph it. You know, um, can you tell me enough about conditional motivation or do you need to go read a research article and come back next week and tell me about conditional motivation? So like you just get challenged and challenged and challenged and challenged. And so that was what that was like for a couple of years. And then you sit for this big exam and that exam is scary. Let me tell you. Um, they used to only do it. So way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, when I got my BCBA, you could only take it four times a year. So there was, you know, a February, a May, and like a couple times a year. Now you can take it anytime. 
and you had to wait like six weeks to find out if you passed or failed. So there was this long wait period. Um, these youngins now find out the day of if they pass their test, but I had to like wait for a while. Um, so that was my journey. And then as soon as I got my BCBA, I mean, I had the fancy letters after my name for like five seconds. I immediately went back to school districts. I only ever wanted to work in schools. Laney, a lot of your training is based, um, surprisingly, not really on student behavior, but more on understanding the adults. Um, why is this so important for teachers, administrators, and parents that are working with the students? It's a hard day when you learn this, and it was a hard day when I learned this, but if you look at a behavior intervention plan, any teacher out there who has access to one, read it. Just go read it. It is not a list of things for that student to do. <laughs> it's a giant list of things for us to do. Um, so it turns out you don't change student behavior by changing student behavior. You change student behavior by changing adult behavior. And that doesn't necessarily mean that teachers are doing things wrong. And that's what is hard. Um, and that maybe you saw in the training, but a lot of times it's just timing based. So maybe the teacher is doing the exact right thing, providing the exact right uh, support for that student, but doing it at the wrong time. And because it's happening at the wrong time, it actually makes problem behavior worse rather than changing it. So um, a lot of times I tell people, I feel like I'm a mechanic and you're like bringing me your car and I'm just checking things. And 99% of the time, it's not like the car has a bad engine or the car has a bad transmission. It's just tighten this lug nut up, like fix this one lug nut here, tighten this here, connect this plug here and we'll be good. So um, the thing is, is that we don't change student behavior by changing student behavior. We have to change ourselves. So Lainey, on the student side of things, and um, you, you know, I'm just kind of thinking about all of the, the, the trauma that we've seen over the last several years. And we always say that, you know, COVID did not, it caused a lot of trauma, but really more than anything, it had shown a light on some of the existing trauma and maybe exacerbated some of that. So, you know, we get a lot of calls about help. We've got all of these students and we're seeing all of these um, student behaviors and, and we we're really trying to work on reestablishing some of these classroom routines and relationships. And so we know that there's, there's been an impact over the last couple of years, but you know, you mentioned timing, but aside from some of those things, one of the things that you talk a lot about, and I know that is really important to you, is that idea of relationships and knowing a student's story, just as it's important to know your story. Um, and it's a, important for adults to know where they're coming from. You also advocate for knowing a student's background and a student's story. So can you can you tell us a little bit more about, about that and why it's so important for us as educators to, to know our students? Sure. Um, it's just important all around. Um, there are scientific methods that I can train teachers on to get better relationships with students. And we never knew that before. Or at least I didn't know when I was a teacher. When I was a teacher, I thought you either were able to build a relationship with a student or you weren't. There are scientific ways to do it, to actually have better relationships with students. And these are research-based methods. So that's the first thing that jumped out at me as a BCBA is whoa, there's a way and a path to have a good relationship with every single student and they don't teach teachers that, that's not fair. Um, the other thing that I'll say there is, yeah, I mean, I came from a high trauma background. I was a mistake. My life was not on purpose for my parents. Um, I was not treasured by them. And there was a lot of abuse and neglect that happened. And due to that, I was a very different kid. And you have to remember, like I'm in my mid thirties, so 30 years ago, I was a kindergartner walking around the school saying, I'm stupid. I shouldn't be here. I, I don't, you know, I shouldn't be loved by anybody. And so that was very throw it through all of the educators that worked with me off because that was not something that you commonly saw back then. Um, now I would say it's a lot more prevalent. I think it's incredibly important to understand a student's story and you're never going to know everything. Um, because you don't have that lens into the home life. You only know what you know. But the thing that I would say is that educators need to understand the struggles that their students are going through so that they can have compassion. Educators also need to understand that it is not your job to fix that student's trauma. It is your job to hold their hand and walk them through this path that they're on. 
if they have a difficult path to walk, they have to walk it. You can either hold their hand and walk it with them, or you can tell them to stop trying and just sit down and not walk the path at all. Um, and so a lot of times the main thing that I see that can be a problem is that educators hear about a student's trauma and they think, oh, well, he'll never be able to go anywhere. So I'll just be nice to him. That ain't enough. It, and, you know, when we got our teaching certificates, it did not come with the right to place a ceiling on that student and say, I don't think you can go higher than X or um, do better than whatever criteria we think they can do. We don't get to place limits on our kids based on their trauma. We need to hear about it. We need to learn about it. We need to care about them and then realize that some of their behavior is going to be related to that. So um, it's a very common trauma response to seek attention. So if you have a student in your classroom acting out to gain access to attention, it could be because they have a very high trauma home life. And so we need to have compassion for that. But what we don't need to do is place a ceiling on that student and just assume that they can't go any further. Such good, good, good stuff, Lainey. Um... So I'm curious as to what your answer is for this next question. Um, with all the all your work out there, um, you know, in different education communities, talking to administrators and teachers and so forth, what do you think the biggest misconception is about student behavior? Oh boy, <laughs> um, that we can't change it, or that um, a placement di dictates a student's behavior. Um, I think that we have a variety of placements out there on purpose. That's because students deserve a variety of placements. But um, sometimes that's the first thing we jump to. And a lot of times what educators will say to me is, I've tried everything and it's not working. So he can't do well here. Um, if you think about that, that's a pretty high opinion of yourself. I've tried everything. So meaning, you know, everything. Um, and I used to say this when I was a teacher and I had a very high opinion of myself. So I'm making fun of me here. Um, but when we say I've tried everything, what you're saying is I've tried everything I know to try. And it is not working. And that's true. And educators feel that in their heart. I have put effort into every single thing I know how to do and it's not getting any better. But the math equation is not I've tried everything I know to try. So therefore, nothing will work with him. It's, I've tried everything I know to try, so the things I know don't work for him. So is it an issue that this student can't learn, or is it an issue of training? I need more training to understand more things so I can try more things. Because many, many times, you know, we will work with students who the educators working with this student feel as though he cannot get any better, and our plans work. So it's not teacher's fault. There's a 60 year research to practice gap. So the things we're doing in the classroom were researched, you know, very long ago, six decades ago. So it might be that there's something that we've discovered in the last 60 years that can change the student's behavior, but teachers don't know it because people aren't there out there training teachers in how to do it. And we don't learn it in our undergrad. So um, I, I would say the biggest misconception is that certain students can't get any better. That's, that's pretty powerful one and life altering too um, on both sides. So, uh, you know, Lainey, um, kind of going hand in hand with that, you mentioned 60 year gap with, with research, catching up with practice. Um, if you were in, an elevator with someone and had two minutes, <laughs> um, and you were you were to have a conver a quick conversation with them about something to either start or stop doing that that is related to maybe some of that research that maybe they just don't know about. What is maybe what's one thing that you would tell um, somebody with you in that elevator to start or stop doing when it comes to understanding students, their trauma, and their associated behaviors. Sure. Um, okay. So it's hard to pick because there's two big ones, but I'll, I'll do my favorite one. So um, if you're an educator and you've spent any time in the behavior space, you have seen ABC data, right? So antecedent, that's what happens before the behavior and the consequence. Um, many times when teachers are looking at student behavior and they've kind of tried to change it, they look at the trigger, what happens before behavior. That's what they're looking for at all times. The trigger is not why that student is acting out. 
It's not. Um, you'll laugh at me because you've seen uh, the workshop, but I tell teachers all the time, this will help you remember, date the antecedent, marry the consequence. The antecedent, you're just going to go to, not even dinner, you're going to take it out to coffee and buy it a coffee, and then you're going to ghost the antecedent and never talk to it again. It gives you like, yeah, don't even text the like, it didn't work out, nothing. Like, you're going to learn from the antecedent what happened right before problem behavior, but behavior is maintained by consequences. And by consequence, I don't mean like a punishment or timeout. I mean, how does the, be, how does the environment change? 15 seconds after that behavior happens. So what we see as teachers, we hand that kid a reading assignment, the kid throws their desk, we stop paying attention because we're like, oh, it must have been that reading assignment that made him throw his desk. Nope, sure not. After he threw his desk, what happened? What changed in that environment? That's why he continues to throw his desk. Is it that I get immediate adult attention? Is it that I immediately escape the classroom? Am I given some sort of regulation item to help me calm down? Okay, so those are the things that are actually maintaining problem behavior. And I'm not saying ignore a kid that throws a desk. Don't do that. That's bad. Um, definitely go tend to that student and help them with their needs, but learn from that 15 seconds and say, huh, I guess that student was craving attention. I guess that student was craving escape. And I guess that student was craving tangible items. So date the antecedent and then get down on one knee, pull out a ring and marry the consequence. I absolutely love that. And I'm not going to forget that one either. That's great. <laughs> Uh, Lainey, you're, you have filled us with so, so much to think about, such good information. Tell us about the support that you provide um, to educators and um, schools. Sure. Um, well, we have a very short menu. Um, I tell our districts, we ain't Ruby Tuesday, we do three things. So um, we can do single student support, um, which is where we just work with one student. We do that in Northern Illinois. Um, we also do classroom coaching, which our teachers really like. And to be honest, our BCBAs really like, I'm very fortunate to work with a team, um, that works with my company of a group of BCBAs who are super talented and passionate about schools. That one's fun because we just go with one teacher, um, in one setting for eight weeks. And we just show up three hours a week, not to give you a list. <laughs> we don't sit behind our laptop and then give you a list of things you have to do in your classroom. That's not the type of BCBAs we are. We come in and say, we're here from a place of service, not of status. How can we help? And so we just provide training hands-on working with the students in the classroom, um, that's honestly all of our favorite thing to do. We love to do that. And then the thing that y'all are probably most familiar with are those one day teach, train, thrive workshops. Um, so we have two, we have a part one and a part two. Um, y'all had part one out in Sterling, Dixon, Sterling. I don't know exactly which one it counts for, but my husband's from Dixon. So he'll get mad if I say it's in Sterling. Um, but yeah, so those are six hour workshops. They're very interactive. Educators say that even though it's a PD day, they actually love it. Um, so you walk away with so many strategies that you can do. So it's all, you know what, the perspective I wrote it from is uh, when I was a teacher, I really wish people had told me some things that I now know as a BCBA. So that six hour workshop is literally everything I wish I had been taught when I was a teacher so that I could have remained happy in the classroom. Lainey, when, when we were thinking about a great way to kick off 2023 with our teacher talks, I told Stacy, I'm like, we have to talk to Lainey. We didn't get a chance to talk to her before she came to Sock Valley Community College here in Dixon to work with all of our teachers in the three county area. We have to talk to her because um, she she is so knowledgeable. She, she does it with grace and with humor and with an abundance of candor. And so uh, I so appreciate you and all of the, the knowledge and resource and supports that you bring to the table um, for any of our educators here in Northwest Illinois to access. And um, furthermore, I really appreciate your thought on um, service over status because we need people like you 
um, right alongside all of us in the trenches to um, help us do what's best for kids and to maybe even along the way understand ourselves. So thank you so much for being here with us today. And we encourage, um, we'll post your contact information in our Facebook post and uh, encourage others to to reach out um, to, to establish any of those services that you offer, as well as we have had conversations, uh, you, you have to you have to come back to, to Dixon. I mean, it, you have to, if that's where your husband's from, we have to make this happen. So um, yeah. we, we are going to look forward to bringing you back for, for day two. And we've already had some districts who are very interested and in, in who missed out or maybe want their entire staff to hear what you have to say on your day one, teach, train, thrive, teach, train, thrive, if I could talk, uh, training. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us here today on Teacher Talk. Okay. Thanks y'all. Ladies and gentlemen, educators of all ages, that wraps us up for this edition of Teacher Talk. Happy New Year. Happy 2023. We hope that you spend the rest of this week enjoying the new start to our new year. Uh, we hope that you have an enjoyable Friday, an ever relaxing weekend, and we will see you right back here next Thursday for another edition of Teacher Talk.